Okay, so <clears throat> in this video I'm going to answer a, um, a concern or a question that um, I was talking to someone about via email and it's to do with um, non-doership or doership and it's a, it seems to be a very common concern with this that um, as realisation deepens, as the sense of the central uh, subject, the, the me, the I, um, falls away, that that means, or or that sense that I think, so that, that means that we're going to run into problems functioning in life, that we're going to lose some sort of control over our autonomy and our ability to function in life in a, in a normal way. Um, so, I, just before you move on, I wanted to, to mention that um, I get a lot of emails from people asking if I do like one-on-one -on -one calls and um, so the answer to that is that, that I, I'm, I'm imposing a limit on myself right now and that I'm not going to accept any one-to-one -one calls because although like I, I do feel motivated to do it because um, I, I really want to see like how this pointing, how this like this, uh, this what would you call it, like a resonance or transmission or pointing works without the, the, the limitations of in real time without the limitations of a back and forth via email um, but for the time being I, I'm imposing a limit on myself and that, I, that I'm I'm not going to take anyone one on one calls purely because I, I know that it will snowball I know that it will it will go arms and legs and, and, and like this channel has and like I, I don't want to give myself commitments and work out with what I'm capable of doing um, at, at this point in time. These things that will, will take time, they'll, they'll logistically take organisation and, and um, it's a bit of a commitment. Uh, so um, for the time being uh, I'm just going to call the limit. Uh, I'm happy to communicate with people like via voice notes or, or email. But in terms of live one-on-one -on -one calls or like group things, because uh, people are asking about like setting up a a group meeting for everyone that's here, um, which sounds cool. Um, but for the time being, yeah, I'm 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 gonna limit that for now. But I do want to to uh, explore that in the future at some point for sure. Um, But yeah, sorry to disappoint if anyone uh, is looking for that. But again, just you know, keep in touch, and um, if this happens in the future, then we'll we'll get it arranged. But I'll let you know. So the the doership thing. The concern is that when the sense of self drops away, what will also drop away is the ability to function in the relative world. So I'll approach this firstly from like a, a conceptual or theoretical um, point of view, and that's just gonna. Um, like I was saying to this person that I was talking to an email that you know. These these fears, these concerns are a very real experience. My, if I give you my experience with it, and and you you will hear the same thing from others probably. Um, and the, it'll be like a, a belief that you might adopt, you might believe that, yeah, okay, this um, fear might be unwarranted, it's just a thought, you know, I know so-and-so, I know plenty of people, I might even know them personally, um, who are maybe deeply realised th these fundamental truths about experience and they, yet they function fine. Um, so you could believe that, but it's not going to do you any good. It didn't do me any good because the the experience, that fear, that concern is is a very real thing. 
adopting a belief or a concept about it isn't going to negate the fear. What negates the fear is the direct experience of what we're talking about here is the 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 absence of that agent, the absence of that individual separate subject from the beginning. So if you th we think back any time that we function in life highly effectively, what like what what I always say or what you'll hear other non dual speakers say is there never was a self, there never was a separate subject. There never never was an autonomous agent in in the way that we believed it, it was real. In the way that we believed it was real. Um that doesn't mean the function isn't there. It just means that the, the reality, the, the real separate agent, the real separate self at an ultimate level was never there, was never real, never had to be there, never was. So what falls away is an illusion. What falls away is, you could say, the belief, the felt belief in something that was never actually there in the first place. The separate self. Um, the clear, direct experience of that is the only thing, for, at least for me, that negated that fear, that worry, that concern. Believing what the non-dual speakers or the writers were saying about it maybe helped a little bit, but ultimately it didn't help. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't, um, it didn't, didn't do anything to really address that concern in a, in a direct way. Um, so I could, I could firstly give you my experience with it and that, you know, I had the same concerns, I had the same um, thoughts. The, the thoughts, if we pay attention, you'll notice they, they're all subjective. They all, they all relate back to me, the subject. So they're all, uh, their context is based off the separate subject, the separate character. And they, they relate to a linear time narrative. They project into the future. So the worry is that when I, I lose this sense of self in a real way, when that falls away, what will also fall away in the future is my ability to function. So already in that, we're believing that the, 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 se the self is a real thing that really disappears. And it has a, a real ability to exert a difference on on this in the future and that it not being there is going to mean this so we can we can easily from a conceptual sense see that that worry is something that's owned by the illusion <laughs> doesn't mean the experience of it isn't real but we can objectively look at that use a little bit, little bit of reasoning and logic and say yeah this this thought that I'm experiencing with the associated emotions relates back to me, the subject, the separate subject, and it refers to something in the future. So easily we can see that's not real. Um, but that doesn't help, that doesn't help. It might, it might. Um, but the felt sense is still very much intact. So what I not noticed with, with this is that the sense of the agent, the sense of the doer, the sense of the me as a se central separate subject in my life was something that was being added to experience, was a mental process that was following along with what was happening. And its function was to understand, uh, contextualize things, gather information and then it's like a tool to be able to project and predict and control for things, to control and understand. Um, it, it can't control for this, it can't predict this. It, like what, what we discover here, um, or what we remember here, in regards to our true nature, is the substance of those thoughts, what that's made of totality, none of it being separate, none of it being compartmentalised as this and that, 
so it's too total to, to for that subjective position to comprehend and to impute meaning um, and predict the the result of realization as what it means to me, what it means, what it will mean in the future. Uh, I'll try and simplify this language a bit. Let me know if let me know if my language is too com complicated, uh, and I'll try and make it more efficient. Because I, I think sometimes I have the tendency to overuse <laughs> language. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try and be a bit more skillful with that in the future. So. Um, So the sense of the doer is something that I noticed follows along in experience very closely, follows along with what's happening. It thinks back and it thinks forwards. You'll notice it always thinks back, it always thinks forwards. It always it relates to something that's not here, right now. So you can spot it quite easily that way. Um, it's always about what will this mean. It's always holding the the object of attention separate and trying to figure it out relating to past and future. We start to get familiar with that function and we start to notice that that function is averting attention away from what's here. It's looking somewhere else. And it has a tension in it, it has an urgency and a restlessness in it, a kind of discontentment in it, a wanting and a need or an aversion or desire in it. So we start to notice that that, we start, I start to bring my attention closer and closer to the immediate. And I started to notice that these thoughts were were kind of following along with what was going on, like creating that sometimes they were well, completely away and like in a different place, creating their own narrative, nothing to do with what was here. But as I brought them closer and closer to the immediate, they, they, they started they, the the focus started to change. Um. So. With inquiry, it would be like before I would worry about past and future. I would like uh, ruminate about, you know, mistakes I'd made in the past, what that meant about me, and I'd project into the future and and think about my qualities as an individual and what that meant about the future. And that was like 90% of the what was going on in my head all, all the time, <laughs> all the time. Exhausting. So when I brought it closer to the immediate, it, it, it started to change and it was like, what what does this mean? So there was like an attention in the, on the immediate, but I noticed this bounce back into a subjective position happened automatically. It would come back to rationalize, conceptualize, understand, uh, attach meaning to and own th this. So an inquiry, it, it, the, the focal point would then turn into what does this mean for me? What does it mean that my experience is like this? Does that mean I'm this? Does that mean I'm not awake? Or even when there were like glimpses of non-dual clarity, it would bounce back and it would like, oh, so I need to get back to that. Assuming that that's not what this already is, I need to get back to that, so then I need to do this. So that same seeking function recontextualized itself around the spiritual narrative. And then when there was an absence of thought, when there was an absence of that subject, when, when it started to become clear that that sub subjective position of the self just didn't need to be there, um, it would kind of like, I'm giving it too much credit as with this but it would kind of stand up for itself and it would be like I'm not having any of that so I'm gonna come back online now and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna 
start start getting some fear into this so that you pay attention to me uh, so that I, I can I can survive um, so it would be like okay you're gonna go insane or are you are you losing your mind now like this isn't normal normal people don't do this you know uh, there'd be some like non-dual glimpses and it would be like you're schizophrenic um, you need to go and get yourself checked out or you're having a stroke stuff like this or what does this mean if you can't relate to the world anymore in a normal way how are you going to relate to people how are you going to hold down a job so I got all the same things but the, the, the thoughts come charged with an emotion and that's the catch that's how it hooks you in because it has an emotional charge to it so it feels real that and if you feel it in the body so it kind of kicks into like a sur survival instinct for this sense of the separate self it seems to be tied to the body and then you get anxiety so it's like um, people that, that I, I talk to will, will say like things like the mind's doing anything it can to, to get my attention. It's like performing to get my attention. And it works a lot of the time. But other times when we're, when they're, they're calm, they're saying that they notice the thoughts as thoughts and they don't seem real. But sometimes a real one come, comes up and then you're in it before you know it. Um, so as we keep recognising our immediate experience so we notice a thought for a thought it loses its power as a real subjective experience happening to a real me that means something real the emotion we feel the emotion directly so we're no longer attaching meaning to it it's just the sensation just like the thoughts it just comes and goes it's transient it starts to untangle this bundle of sensations and thoughts and assumption and context that, that we, we believe to be a me. And it untangles into what's here now. What's here now starts to become the most overt aspect of experience. And the attention stops bouncing about in the mind and it, and it kind of expands out into what's here and it's still. It's peaceful. And from that expanded, you could say, vaguely subjective position, that a lot of the thought loses its power. So we can see that these thoughts that appear with the emotion that, that, that describe to us what this is going to mean in the future for me, how it's going to mean that I'm not going to function, are noticed as just a transient sensation, a transient thought experience. One thought, and it always appears as one thought. When we buy into that thinker, that se separate subject, we start to experience a thought stream, a narrative that we're following along, and it gets really stressful. Like, I got to the point, at a certain point, where if I, I noticed that if I got lost in that thought narrative, I would start to get a headache I would start to experience physical pain symptoms. I would start to get like, uh, people describe this as the Kundalini. I think it was something like that. Like a, like a you know, you ever get like a, an adrenaline rush where it comes up the back of your head into your scalp? Something like that it would come with like pain in the back of the neck and uh, a pain behind the eyes, a sore head. So it became really obvious when that was snowballing. Um, but then coming back to the one thought, or just thought, not labelling it or anything like that, just, it's just a thought. You notice it dissolves, and then what's here is here, and it's the, the urgency, that f restless feeling that I need to engage with something, I need to figure something out, it comes up, it comes up, and we just notice it as such, and it's okay, just feel it. Come back to this. So as we got, I noticed this, as I got more 
finally in tune with the direct experience, what was actually here, including the thoughts. I started to notice that this narrative was following along with what was unfolding. So it was something that was added to. It didn't need to be there all the time. And that started to prove itself an experience where um, through this like inquiry, I could get to the point where you know it, you could you could I could sit in presence. I, I could inquire into a space of pure self-aware knowingness, and then there would be like blocks of that at times, depending on the circumstances. But then it started to be sensed and experienced there all the time. I guess you could like call it like a, an animating force behind manifestation, something like that. So then I noticed kind of like a disconnect between that. That, that I, I, I knew I didn't need to think to walk or to do the dishes or um, more and more doing activities started to become apparent that it doesn't need to be a doer here, this can just be happening on its own intuitively um, but the sticky part was the, the, the planning, the, the, the thought the interacting with people um, performing cognitive tasks that, that, that are required to use mind as a tool to project for a, a functional reason um, So then it started to become apparent that the thoughts themselves, this narrative that's following along, isn't something that I'm adding to experience as the central character, as a subject. It's just spontaneous. It comes out of nowhere of its own accord due to this conditioning. Like I'm not even in control of it. it th th there's... With this inquiry, even the inquiry became quite spontaneous and intuitive. And that's when the, the, the holding on to this doer, this uh, one in the centre, that this agent that's in control with its own autonomy, that's doing something here, that has to control this, started to, to let go. It was a function in thought that was making it look like that, like a felt reality of this thought function with this central subject at the centre with this doing me at the centre, the doer. So in a way, you can, I, I, I kind of got behind the thought to see that, that you know, it just appeared. I, I, there was no me back here in control of the thought. It just appears. And with that, the whole struggle with thought as well levelled out. And because there was no subject struggling with it, the whole thing calmed down. And thought wasn't as much of a problem anymore. Nor were the sens sensations. So what those thoughts were suggesting as what this means for me in the future, as the subject, um, that whole, the, the, the illusion of that was kind of released by the direct experience of, of, of seeing that um, I wasn't in control I wasn't ever in control in the way that I thought I was and I didn't need to be that wouldn't, that was never happening so it's, it's the letting go of that came about through the kind of clear seeing of it through the direct experience like really closely into now what was happening now what was actually going on in my experience now, not what's suggested about what this means in the past and the future, or even what this means now, but what's actually happening. So that leads me into like a couple of inquiries that we can use to um, uncover this, or see that, you know, the the projections into the future with the meaning we can we can adopt another belief and say that's not real but 
until we actually see what's happening with that thought immediate in immediacy and and more importantly what am i that's believing in that thought the then the 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 belief in the the, uh, the reality of what the thought's suggesting is always going to have that kind of catch there and it's uh, it's going to keep repeatedly bringing up this or seeming to bring up this anxiety or this fear which again helps with that catch so it, um that's what kind of we're avoiding. We're avoiding the uncomfortable sensation, the uncertainty, the unknowability and the fear. And that all appears now. So we're now we're looking at now what what's making it what's making my experience feel like that. So it's a thought. So these thoughts suggesting about the future or something that there's a felt belief there, that's why I'm concerned about it. So, like like I said at the beginning, what what is this thought suggesting about my experience? What are the assumptions here? Not so much conceptual now, but what does it feel like? So maybe I, I, I feel like I'm separate. I feel like I'm a separate person that exists in time. And I feel this worry and anxiety about what this awakening thing means for me in the future. And I can feel that now, so we go to the feeling of it. You feel that anxiety, that emotion, that tension. And we feel it fully and we fully accept it fully accept it, it's okay that that's there, you can recognise that it is there and it's like, it's okay that that's there, there's nothing I can do about it, there's nothing I need to do about it, I, I don't need to fix it, all I need to do is feel it, feel it as fully as possible, not resisting it, accepting it, even trying to bring it about, not using thought but by tuning into it directly, bring, bring it about in as much intensity as we can. Or even say to ourselves, it's okay that this sensation, this emotion is here. And it can be there as long as it wants. Sometimes we might just need to sit with that for a bit. from that anchor point of this immediate, and it's going to be like a visceral sensation, like a physical sensation. We can then prove to ourselves and experience that I'm not in control. These thoughts that are framing my experience in a way that is making it uncomfortable. I'm not even in control in the first place. They're just happening on their own. And we can prove that to ourselves by, through intention, through um, conscious decision, we're gonna consciously decide that for the next, you know, I don't know how long it's gonna take, but for the next hour, if I've got the time, I'm gonna sit here and I will not think, there, there, there won't be one thought that passes through my mind. If I'm the subject, if I'm in control of my experience, if I'm the thinker, if I'm in control of my mind, I should be able to take control of this mental process and say that I'm not going to think, not one thought will pass through my mind within the next hour. And of course that's a guaranteed failure. And it, I mean, it's possible someone could be very good at meditation and they, 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 they could um, quiet the mind for an hour. Um, in which case we would uh, apply the same uh, intention, the same inquiry to a different situation. One that's not sitting meditating. And we'll quickly see that I'm not in control of these thoughts. 
So if we think we are, if we think we're the thinker, the subject in here that's in control, we're absolutely at the mercy of this um, thought experience. So we're never going to be able to control that. We're just always going to be fighting with it. So then we look back at the the, the sense of the me that, that is struggling with thought, struggling with these worries, has all, already lost a, a bit of its reality. Because we've just proven to ourselves that I'm not in control. So the thoughts that are following along with experience, owning experience, claiming experience as a personal um, as a personal experience in which I'm the central autonomous agent. We can, we're already starting to see why that's so uncomfortable and why we don't feel like we're in control, why we're worried about losing control. We could even ask that we even ever feel like we're in control in the first place, if we're honest. Did we ever actually feel like we, we knew what was going on? So then we can start observing the, the, the narrative of the mind a bit more closely just throughout the day and say, and explore like, what what's there that doesn't need to be there? What, what stories is the mind making up and telling itself um, that just absolutely don't match up with what's actually going on? So then we can start to let go of little bits of this by just expanding out a little bit and seeing them for thoughts and that they dissolve. Not resisting them, not pushing them away, not trying to change them, just noticing. So the perspective is, is not boxed in anymore, it's expanding out the way. And with that comes a steadiness, a peace, a, a clarity. Kind of like an expanded subjective position, what people refer to as the witness, the witness state. Which I think is an important stage in this, the detached witness. So we're not getting into it and engaging with it, we're, we're just observing. And that gives us a kind of expanded uh, perspective fr from which we can then use to um, kind of like um, release some of the beliefs about the reality of these stories. And we'll, we'll probably notice that, that, that they're all in the context of these uh, thoughts. They're all suggestive of, in some way, of the thinker, the separate subject, the me. In the context of this, th these thoughts, they all suggest, maybe not all of them, but in large part, like, you know, most, if not all, of the thoughts are contextualized and I am the subject, I am the thinker, and I'm relating to whatever the thought object, whatever the objective thought's about. So it's always going to be framed in subjectivity and it's always going to be framed in time. So then we start getting more interested in the sense of this, the the separate subject, the sense of the me as the thinker, the one who seems to be in control of all this. These are just steps to take towards letting go of the uh, 
the belief that this is going to mean something and kind of getting getting behind the thoughts such that they lose their power of suggestion uh, and their their power to distract us by suggesting something about the the nature of uh, it's something about what this is going to mean in the future and we're seeing that the, the one at the center of that that believes that isn't actually there in the way that we thought it was we directly there's direct clarity on that so already we're seeing that um, the reality of these what these thoughts are suggesting are, are based on something false are based off of an illusion N the more and more we see that they don't need to be there the less and less they're, they're there in any real way so and th this is this is maybe one that takes a bit of time and uh, th this kind of approach in different aspects of life can help soften this this uh, real solid experience of the, uh, the central character um, that's why you know I, I think a good part of the approach to this that people use inquiry is kind of like um, sitting for meditation periods or like a couple hours or an hour or something like that multiple times a day um, but I, th I think to really see through this you, you have to observe it um, I, I think that's maybe a good, a good shout at the start but to really see through this function you have to observe it in, in real time as it's happening in, in different um, uh, circumstances in life. So, and I think that's what lends itself to becoming a, a realization rather than just a, a experience. So what's there when we get behind the thoughts? When we ask what will be the next thought without knowing or trying to control what will come about in mind? What will be the next thought? And behind and through that, or in the gaps between that, get in touch with what what is it that I am that is here and is wide awake? What is it that I am that is here, inherently self-aware and knows all of this? Knows all experience indiscriminate. Uh, I think I might have to move in a minute because I'm in a car park and there's people trying to park, so we'll see if they go away. I don't actually need to be here, so... Um, So then we get into this kind of direct immediate presence and this direct immediate presence it starts to permeate the every aspect of our experience. So it's not it's not just limited to um, certain situations in life or certain designated periods in life. 
it starts to permeate every aspect and, and what is realized when we discover our own inherent beingness our inherent present self-aware knowingness is that that starts to what starts to lose its focus is the the separated version of reality the subjective position that we function from that from that uh, vantage point these thoughts and worries and projections feel real what starts to overtake that in its reality is is what is what is what all that's made of what what all that is known how, how all that knows itself as you as your experience and there's a kind of transition there um, and that transition there involves like I said letting go of a lot of the um, these assumptions, these uh, framings of reality from the assumed subjective position, and with that goes a lot of the the worries and the concerns and the attempt to control, the uh, struggle for agency and autonomy, um, the fear of letting go, the fear of losing control, and. that's replaced with the absolute certainty of being the absolute undoubtable presence that is always inherently here that includes all the physical visceral or emotional sensations that we were trying to control we get in contact with that and then we orient towards that fully so then the need to contextualize this in a narrative to try and control it to try and uh, desire certain experiences or avert from other experiences loses its uh, there's a loss of interest in that So, there never was a self here in the way that we, we believed it was in the first place. And that goes all the way back. So, when the illusion is, is seen through, when, when this clarifies, things just go on as they do. So thoughts appear spontaneously um, in a practical sense due to the infinite conditions of the universe without an agent. And the doing continues, the problem solving continues, the functioning continues. It's just clear that there was never a central one here for that to be, that had to be here, that had to be in control for that to be happening. I mean, there, there are, um, there is kind of like an integration period with this. Or okay, I guess I could just say that this there is an integration with this and it, there is a kind of um, th there is like a relative process to this and this relative process is like the, the most radical transformation that I guess we will go through in life so it does come with some um at times practical adaptations that, that need to be made um, some kind of relational aspects that might need to be addressed and and so on but it's, it's nothing like what the, the mind would frame it as in like I'm gonna lose my <laughs> my mind um, I'm gonna lose functionality I won't be able to function I'll have to become monastic um, You know, if I can do it, maintain a relationship, 
uh, raise two kids, work a full time job with high responsibility, then anyone who's watching this can can do it as well. But the key is in, in not adopting that as a belief and not using my situation as an example, but actually clearly seeing through direct inquiry the function that's making it seem that way. This is making the experience um, or those projections into the future feel real, feel like something that I have to worry about. Anyway, I think that'll do for now, but I'll talk to you next time.